Thank you, Simon. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. My name is Dave. Um, like I said, uh, or like Simon said, I work at uh, Globacore. We are an interactive design shop that does a lot of um, AR, a lot of VR, a lot of mixed reality, a lot of other stuff, too. Um, but today, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Free Roam VR, uh, which is a project that we made last year, and we showed off at a, a show in Santa Clara called AWE. Um, and this is kind of the story of how we went from nothing, really, uh, to getting the opportunity to show there, to actually having a finished app that we were um, uh, really happy with. And, and we went from that, uh, you know, from nothing to there in the span of about three to four weeks. Um, so in order to get there, uh, we kind of wound up, you know, um, there was the kind of a backstory to this whole thing in some ways. We, uh, you know, it was a year full of um, projects that we were doing a lot of uh, VR type stuff. We were doing a lot of... Um, uh, room scale tracking and stuff like that. Um, so we uh, ended up at a point where we were kind of like working on a lot of the stuff and we were kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so for instance, we, uh, one of the projects we did, this is uh, Escape Tomb VR. So this is one of the very first things that we ever did. Is it playing? It's not playing. How do I get it to play? Why is it not playing? Okay, um, so we ended up doing a Scape Tomb VR. What this was was it actually uh, it was a, a room scale uh, tracked environment. Um, we did this for Samsung in uh, San Francisco, um, and what it was was it, this uh, kind of Escape Tomb uh, style puzzle. So you were inside of a Mayan temple, um, and you had to solve this puzzle in order to get out. And one of the cool things that we did with this whole thing is that we were tracking actual props in the space, um, which maybe I'll try and actually find the video. Uh, which one was it? This one. I think the most impressive demo we saw was from Globacore. They had this sort of escape room with eight $3,500 OptiTrack cameras feeding into a six-core desktop running a GTX 980. And then from there, the positional data was streamed over Wi-Fi to a Galaxy S7 in a Gear VR that is actually running the game itself. The graphical fidelity of which was the best we saw running off of a phone here at the show. The position of rigid bodies, uh, their rotations and positions in the scene are being tracked by the cameras. So I mean like that's kind of enough of it, that's the gist of it. We ended up using an OptiTrack rig um, which was kind of our motion tracking solution. So that thing would kind of track uh, the headset in the space but it also tracks like uh, props like this for instance is a, um, is a lantern and we could actually see it moving around in the space and we mapped it back to an actual physical lantern inside the game. So as you walked around and moved around, it would actually light the scene up. Um, there were other props in the game. There was, uh, uh, what else was there? There were some statues that you could move around and you'd had to like move them into certain positions to like unlock certain parts of the puzzle. Um, there was a gem that you had to like put just so inside of like the, the eye of like this big uh, idol thing. Um, so this was like kind of the very first time that we had ever done anything that was um, of this scale uh, and using kind of an OptiTrack setup. Uh, and it went really well, actually. Everyone that was involved at, uh, in the project was really happy with it. There was a lineup around the corner the entire night that we were there. Um, we heard that the wait times were upwards of an hour, but everyone was waiting and, and were like actually blown away when they got to try the thing. Uh, everyone had a blast, which was great for us. Um, so the next project we ended up working on uh, around that time was Haunted VR. Again, this was a project for Samsung that we did, um, but at this time it was um, at their 837 studio, which is in New York City. Um, they have, among other things, it's a very big space that has a lot of stuff going on, but they also have, among other things, is uh, this kind of um, auditorium kind of style area, not entirely unlike this. So you have the seats, and then there was like this big open space, uh, and they wanted to put something in there. And um, so the space was around 10 feet by 20 feet, I think, somewhere around there. And they wanted something to show there. They wanted something that was kind of like what we had done you know, for SDC at the, the last project, something that was room scale and, and we were tracking space. Um, and they wanted it to work on the gear headset. So again, we ended up kind of setting up an OptiTrack rig. Uh, and this time, it was the same basic idea. We put a rigid body pattern on the front of the um, flashlight. So you could walk around and, and track with the flashlight and see kind of the, the environment that we had built. Um, for this one, we ended up kind of going with, uh, it was for Halloween, so we obviously had to make something a bit more on the scary side. Uh, we went with this kind of haunted um, hospital kind of theme. And one of the cool things we did here is because the space was so small, it was only a 10 feet by 20 feet space, um, but our ambitions, I think, were much larger than that in a lot of ways. 
Um, we wanted to make something that was, you know, a full hospital that you could actually walk through and, and have something stalking you and actually feel like you went on this kind of adventure. Um, so we ended up employing uh, what we call non-Euclidean geometry. And for people who don't know, what that means is that uh, it's geometry that is physically impossible in the real world uh, for all intents and purposes. So for instance, you would be walking down a hallway, turn, and then uh, through a door, and that would bring you into another room. But that room, if it existed in reality, would actually be sitting on top of the room that you just finished walking through. Um, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't uh, work in reality. but inside of VR, we can actually, if we present it as reality, people kind of accept it. Uh, and we learned that this way. Um, we weren't entirely sure if, if people were going to catch on or not, but even if they did, we kind of just figured, you know, this is a haunted game. It's supposed to be kind of spooky. And if people thought that, like, hey, wait, this doesn't actually like line up exactly, that that was fine. Um, so it was like a nice little testing environment for us, and it worked out really well. Everyone like really had a blast with it. Uh, and the last one of the big ones, anyway, that we did uh, for uh, that year was Virtual Code Battle. Um, so Virtual Code Battle, and I will show you another video because they don't want to play, unless I can make it play. Uh, please play. Huh. All right, so I'll just show it to you this way. that down a bit. So Virtual Code Battle was uh, a space that was uh, 10, or sorry, 20 feet by 20 feet. Um, and the idea here is that you were like inside of the computer, basically. It was uh, kind of a Tron-like thing where you were inside the matrix. And uh, you were trying to kind of squash software bugs uh, by playing this game. Um, the, the thing about this is that, A, it was the biggest space we'd have ever done. Uh, this was 20 feet by 20 feet. Uh, B, it was running on an Oculus, but we wanted to make sure that there was no cabling or anything like that. Um, backtops are a thing that exists now. There are computers or laptops you can actually just wear on your back. But back then, those just were not a thing. So you can actually see here, uh, they actually just full on, we, we, I can't even remember what it was. We just like got someone to like weld a thing together for us so we could like mount a, a laptop to it, basically. Uh, and then we have our own like homebrew batteries kind of sitting on the, their, their waistband here, uh, complete with like these super hack-ass Arduino things that would kind of like beep at you if the battery was getting too low and everyone would have to scramble to try and replaced the battery before the whole thing died on us. Um, but again, it was like one of those things where uh, it went really well. Um, we actually saw while we were there, there was uh, people that um, were actually showing off backtop computers, some of the very first ones we'd ever seen. Um, and they were in the booth next to us. And their ones uh, over the course of the show actually like uh, died and like broke in weird ways. And so we were sitting there, we, we smelled you know, the kind of ozone smoke at some point. And everyone freaked out and like went running to the to like thinking of, you know, our computers, our, our super homebrew computers have totally broken, but no, it was actually theirs. We were totally fine, um, which was like crazy. Um, but that was like another project that we had done that was kind of like in the same rough vein of some of the stuff we had been doing. It was, you know, it was uh, uh, tetherless, it was VR. We were getting now into multiplayer stuff. Um, and so, I mean, that was virtual code battle, but you know, that wasn't actually all that we even did that year. Uh, this was just last year alone, and this largely is only uh, my team that I'm on. Uh, Global Core is actually split into two teams in each of their own projects. So last year, we worked on all this stuff for different clients, including, you know, RS, Osram, Toyota, uh, Samsung, Intel, IEEE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And every single one of these projects, uh, they, they all shared, you know, common things. They were all VR. Uh, a lot of them were uh, multiplayer. They all had a registration component, um, you know, all these different things. And we found ourselves kind of like reinventing the wheel every single time. Uh, there was just never really enough time between projects to kind of like take what we had, had, had kind of built and, uh, and kind of separate it out from the project to make it easier for the next one. Um, so we had a bit of a lull, and we decided um, that we should form a bit of a framework here take all the components that we had, take everything that we've been doing, and make them a bit more flexible so that we could actually just build these projects much, much faster uh, and not feel like we were flying by the seat of our pants all the time. So we ended up creating the Free Roam Framework, which for us uh, includes, among other things, some basic network connectivity. It ends up being a very important thing, just being able to make sure um, that we can you know, just connect, disconnect, handle that kind of stuff gracefully. Um, also provide different client types and stuff like that. So, you know, like for most games, you know, you have your obvious like player type uh, of character. But there can also be different components such as like a registration one that is a network component that, you know, 
uh, joins the game the same as anything else, but it has its own special instructions. It's only sp uh, supposed to run on a, a tablet and be for like data capture or one that connects to the game but only acts as a remote control basically to start the thing. Um, being able to be flexible in that way was like really important for us and have these different flexible client types that all could, uh, could connect and do different things. Uh, another big thing that was important for us was kind of headset ag agnostic VR. Um, so for us, we do a lot of work with a lot of different uh, technologies. We do stuff with uh, Oculus. We do stuff with Vive whenever we can, actually, because we love it. Um, but we also do a lot of work with Samsung, and there's no really getting around using a, uh, a gear, if that's the case. Um, and so if our solution only addressed one of those three or two of those three, then it really wouldn't work for us. We need to make sure that we have something that's flexible and works with everything. Um, along with that is the kind of the room scale tracking solutions. So obviously if we're using uh, a Vive, we have to go with the lighthouses. If we're using uh, the Oculus, we have to go with the OptiTrack camera system. Um, so being able to like swap in and out those kind of tracking solutions is also, again, very important for us. Uh, the last kind of big thing that we wanted to try and kind of tackle as part of the framework, and it maybe seems a little less intuitive than the others, is the uh, network-based physics interaction system. So that actually winds up being kind of a difficult thing to do, uh, specifically passing back and forth authority. So if I pick up you know, a, a cube inside of VR and toss it over to my friend, um, he needs to be able to pick it up. He needs to be able to see it coming at him or catch it or throw it back or anything like that. Um, in terms of like networking stuff, it's actually kind of difficult to do. Uh, and it's time consuming, too. And it's hard to get right. So uh, and it actually turns out that, that that kind of stuff is really compelling for people, being able to just like pick up blocks and just kind of throw them at their friends and, and that kind of thing um, is something that everyone kind of really just like loves inherently doing. So we wanted to make sure that we could kind of build that right into the system and just have it so that we didn't have to shy away from it just because it was time consuming or difficult. Um, so the, that, that, at that point, we had the framework. Uh, and then so now the part where we actually start talking about free roam VR. Uh, and I guess I'll have to load this video again. Uh, where is it? Okay. Um, so by the time we had finished uh, working on the framework, we ended up kind of uh, taking out some space inside of Sheridan's CERT um, warehouse. It's downtown. It's like by the water. Uh, and we got access to the whole warehouse. We set up our cameras there. And really, the idea here was that we wanted to try and test out a gigantic space uh, and see how viable it was. So this is a 60 foot by 30 foot space that we set up in. And what we basically did was we took a bunch of uh, apps and games that we had, had kind of made in the past. Uh, we took some kind of art scenes that our artists had been just kind of working on for fun. Uh, we took kind of everything and anything that we could find and just kind of threw it in here and, and kind of roamed around and see what we thought of it. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of like had, I think it was uh, three days that we got to mess around with in this space. And, uh, and it was awesome, actually. One of the, the coolest things I think I've done in a good long while is uh, while I was doing this, I got to actually like run in 3D, like end to end, 60 feet. I got to, to jog um, from end to end in VR, and it was crazy. It was uh, really, really cool that I got to do that. Um, we kind of worked out some of the, the you know, technical bugs and stuff like that, the idea of like running around in a space that big. And Ben was stepping on the bugs just there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like at that point, we knew that we actually can do a space that big. It'll work, um, which was nuts. It was something that we weren't entirely sure was going to work, but it did. Uh, and right around this time, we actually got an invitation from, I think the way it basically worked was we knew somebody who knew somebody who worked at, at AWE. And we got an extended an offer to actually show something there, uh, whatever we wanted. We had some floor space if they... Uh, if we wanted it. And so um, it was just a matter of, of figuring out what it is we wanted to do there. Uh, you know, the obvious thing would have just kind of been show off something that we had already been working on, show off a, a, you know, one of the like 20 projects that we worked on that year. But we had this brand new free roam framework, and we had this 60 by 30 space that we just decided, like, this totally works. And this kind of ambition of just like, maybe we can actually make something here. Um, so, I mean, like, obviously, we had some questions, you know, first of all being, can they actually even accommodate that? We, we had no idea. That's a, kind of a big ask for, you know, a trade show to say, like, hey, can we have 60 feet by 30 feet, please? Uh, chances are good they would say no. But actually, no, it turns out, yeah, they, they actually totally can accommodate a size that big, which was crazy and, and appreciated. Uh, the next logical question is, do we actually think we could make something? Uh, <laughs> we had about three weeks left um, before it was time to leave. And the answer there was kind of, 
I don't know. <laughs> I hope so. Um, but I mean, we kind of knew that you know we had made this free room framework. It was meant to solve kind of in some ways this exact problem of just making it so that if we have not a lot of time to make something, and but still want to, uh, it all, all the kind of hard parts gonna get taken out of the equation, and we're left with just time to make you know the actual application. Um, so we kind of went on with it. We, we decided, okay, well, I mean, we have three weeks. Uh, this isn't for a client. We do a lot of client work, um, you know, as you saw before. And if we had gone to a trade show for a client uh, and something hadn't worked out, obviously it would have been bad, but it was just us. We were just kind of going there for ourselves. Um, and we kind of, you know, if, if it didn't work out, we could always just show something else, one of the other projects that we had. So we kind of went on with it. Uh, so sprint one, we had about three weeks left at this point. And in this sprint, we kind of decided on some core technology components. Um, so, you know, the, the backtops that I was talking about earlier, those existed now. Those were like something that you could go out and buy. Uh, and we did. We had a bunch of them. Um, so we kind of settled on those with uh, an Oculus uh, headset and the OptiTrack cameras. Um, the one kind of curveball in this whole thing is that uh, OptiTrack streams data over Wi-Fi. Um, and if you have ever been to a trade show, you will know that that is a horrible way to kind of, uh, it's, it's not great to rely on Wi-Fi in the best of times. Um, but when your head tracking and your, your positional tracking is completely being streamed over Wi-Fi, uh, it has the potential to go south in a hurry. And if it does, I mean, like if you're walking and all of a sudden you, your body stops moving in VR, like you'll fall over, you'll start to feel sick. Um, so relying on Wi-Fi is kind of a scary proposition, but we ended up kind of fixing that um, with the Cisco Meraki uh, wireless access point. And what that thing does is that it's just, it's so powerful and it just pumps so much data, uh, so much signal, sorry, into the space uh, that if you were to like look on it on a graph, and we have before, you can actually see like all, like here's all the different signals that are exist in the space, and here is like the Meraki, it's just, it, it eclipses everything, um, which for all I know means that like nobody else in vicinity can get an actual signal. <laughs> for all I know, everyone else had problems, but it worked great for us, uh, so we were happy. Um, so we decided on that as kind of our technology, our hardware stack anyway. Um, we had started working on some kind of uh, art tests at the time. Um, and those art tests ended up turning into scenes that we were going to show. So the basic idea was that it was going to kind of be of a, a show of, of capabilities for uh, Globacore. And we would do that by just showing some different scenes and, and having some light interaction and stuff like that. And the, the centerpiece would just really be like, we're in multiplayer space in this gigantic area and isn't that cool. Um, so we kind of settled on some scenes. One of them in the top left there, that was a, a warehouse that was actually a prototype for a completely different project, but it was big enough. It was actually the right size. Um, so we threw that into the, the framework. Um, the uh, one on the right here is kind of like this New York kind of style scene that I want to say was actually for, I want to say that was for a project too, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. And uh, the last one in the bottom left, um, that one is kind of a throwback to a lot of the we do a lot of work for a lot of cool clients. We also uh, have in the past and probably will continue in the future to do a lot of pharmaceutical work for those kind of companies. Um, so we wanted to kind of show that we have that capability too, that even if you're a pharmaceutical company, we can make something cool that is you know, inside of a, a track space like that. Um, so those were the scenes we kind of settled on to begin with anyway. Uh, and our key learnings from that um, sprint was you know, that the overall art with the, of the project we were happy with, but we needed to, yeah, we needed to focus on um, the user experience next. Uh, walking around in that space was awesome for us, and we were happy with it, but I mean, you need to be able to do something. Um, people won't find that particularly engaging if it's five minutes of just kind of standing around in a space saying, hey, isn't this cool that this works? Um, good enough for us, maybe not good enough for them. Uh, so sprint two, we had about two weeks left. One of the things that we had kind of been working on uh, as another kind of side project was actually um, Global core projects tend to be really, really short in terms of uh, the amount of time that we have from the time that its uh, production starts to the time that the show goes. It's not entirely uh, unusual for it to be like a three to even two week turnaround sometimes. Um, and as a result, we actually end up uh, shying away from character work a lot of the time. Characters just take a long time to make. They take a long time to model, to unwrap, to you know, texture, rig, animate. The whole process can take you know, two to three weeks per character. And so as a result, we just kind of don't do a lot of them. And there was a bit of an R&D project to say, like, you know, this is kind of a, a, a spot that we could do, be, uh, be doing better with. Um, we don't want to have to be able to say no, no characters because, you know, it's difficult to do. So how do we get around that? So uh, around this time, we were actually kind of toying around with some um, technologies that could uh, help us um, make these characters faster. 
Uh, one of them is uh, this right here. This is Adobe Fuse. Um, so Fuse is, it's not a modeling application. What it is more than anything is just like a series of uh, prefab um, body parts, basically. So you could pick, you know, this face, these arms, you know, this t-shirt, this pair of pants, and then it creates a character for you based on that. And they look pretty good, actually. Um, and then the other cool thing about this thing is that it will rig the character for you and then actually send you to um, a website that you could actually go to to uh, add animations to it, too. Um, and then export from there and actually toss the whole thing into Unity. So from the time that we grabbed Fuse for the first time and kind of messed around with it to the time we had something working in Unity that was an actual character that could animate and walk around was... I don't know, maybe an hour or so. Um, and it only got shorter from there once we understood how to use it a bit better. Um, so that was that. I mean, like, we kind of figured that out. Uh, and the natural thing um, for us was, uh, and this came about, I think it was, I think it was one late night that we were working on some of this stuff, uh, working on the, the, the free roam VR stuff. And I think it was like around midnight or something, and we were doing a, uh, a lighting pass so that we could make a build and put it out onto the backtops to test. And lighting can just kind of take forever. Sometimes it takes upwards of like, you know, an hour for the lighting passes to finish. Um, so we were just kind of sitting around, and I was just goofing around um, and just playing around with the, you know, some of this stuff. And I think it was about a half hour or so, I went from, you know, nothing to, to building this character out. And uh, while I was kind of looking around in Mixamo for animations, uh, I ended up finding this, which again, I guess I'll have to show you this way. Uh, So this goes on, uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, the entire Thriller dance is just kind of on that website, and you can just have it for, like for free, uh, <laughs> which was kind of bananas, uh, and it was like a fun way to spend the night, but I also kind of, you know, recorded that, that whole thing because I thought it was awesome and uh, showed it to everyone the next morning, and the, uh, the consensus was pretty unanimous, so we're doing a big zombie dance finale at the end of this thing for sure now, um, and then so we did, which I will now show you. Where is it? Here. Nope. And I don't know if I can skip ahead. Can I skip ahead? No. It's also a little on the dark side. This is um, this was a cabin in the woods scene. This was another art test that we ended up doing that we just thought was like a cool scene. Um, so we threw it in there, and again, this was like one of those things where we just wanted something cool and engaging to put in here, and the, nat the, the zombies felt like kind of a natural fit. Uh, so this is them kind of like shambling their way in. The idea is that you walk inside of the cabin, which is just out of view. <laughs> yeah, so this was like kind of our alpha version of this. Um, but yeah, the cabin existed just outside of view, so basically the way it worked was because it was a 60 by 30 space, it was actually big enough that we could start uh, everyone off in the front yard outside and have them walk up and inside of the cabin and kind of explore around inside the cabin. And then when that happened, we would trigger the zombies to kind of shamble out. Uh, everyone was, you know, ooh, spooky. Um, and then they would kind of get in position and then start the dance, and everyone laughed. <laughs> it was the plan, anyway. Um, so, where am I again? Here we go. Uh, so that was the end result of that. Uh, another thing, we kind of started adding some light interaction to things. So the idea was that we were going to ramp up over time um, some of the interactions. So, um, the warehouse ended up being the very first scene that we did. Uh, we wanted to kind of start small and kind of work our way up. So in the first scene, we had some uh, character scans. This is a um, uh, scan from Quantum Capture. And again, in this scene, it wasn't meant to do much necessarily. It's just kind of like to kind of get everyone's uh, VR legs, I guess. So you kind of exist in the scene. There's uh, the, the, the character scan. He just kind of like looks around or whatever. Uh, there's not much to that one, but it does kind of like ramp up over time is the plan. Uh, so that's that one. Yes, okay. Um, we started working on some interaction and some animation inside of our uh, Synapse scene. There we go. 
So you can see kind of synapses firing off. Uh, there's actually a couple of, of these uh, neurons that are close enough to you inside of the space that if you walk over and touch them, they'll fire out. Uh, again, it's meant to be like a light interaction. It's kind of like building up over time. So scene one, there isn't much interaction. Scene two, there's this. Oops. And then. Uh, so then we had scene three. Um, this one was actually meant to be uh, space, which I will probably hopefully be able to find. Is it this one? Maybe it's this one. Yes. Okay, so this one is a space station. This was like the third scene that we made. Um, and the cool thing here is that it is using some of those networked uh, physics props that I was talking about earlier. So you can knock things off, um, you can toss things back and forth to your friends, and because of the space, we also added this giant button here that I'm sure someone will tap in a moment. Um, but the button actually turns off gravity, so when you hit it, every single thing that's in the scene kind of just starts floating up, and as you start throwing things around, it floats around. Um, and again, this is like, you know, in terms of like ramping up the interactivity, we're kind of, we're getting up there at this point. Um, this is one that kind of was, uh, <laughs> everyone had a, a real blast with. Oh, actually works. Really well, that works into scene four, um, which is uh, the city scene. Um, so we kind of, I don't actually remember how we got to the point that we did, but at some point we decided that the city scene was actually going to be a space invasion uh, kind of shooter thing. Nope, oh, wait. Yeah, let's see. Oops. There we go. Um, yeah, so I, I, again, I don't exactly remember how this came about, but we went from it's you know New York City to like it's New York City with, with like voxel space invader people kind of coming at you, uh, and you pick up your guns out of this kind of like um, Borderlands style chest and you can shoot at them. Um, and I don't, yeah, like I said, I don't remember exactly where it came from, but it was a cool idea and we, everyone had like a lot of fun doing it. So that was kind of <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's me and John test, uh, testing late one night. I think at some point, too, like one of us just starts like twirling in circles and you know, shooting up into the sky. Yeah, I think that was that, just there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were tired at this point. <laughs> um, so that's that scene. Um, so the key learnings here is that, you know, we were kind of getting to the point where the interaction was uh, fun and engaging. We were really having a fun time just like going through everything. Um, but that it all just felt like kind of a bunch of disjointed scenes. There was no real, like, there was nothing to kind of tie everything together. Um, so we wanted to try and tell us a bit of a story, uh, which, you know, we had five scenes, so just kind of figuring out a way of stringing these things together so that they at least progress naturally. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing, you know, like I was saying before, the network physics interactions, they're just inherently fun. Everyone kind of loves doing them. They're just tossing a ball at your friend and stuff like that is just fun. Uh, so that moves us on to sprint three. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do, and it's something we've done in the past for a lot of the, the multiplayer stuff that we've done, but being able to hear people in the space is really important, obviously. Um, up until that point, we had used a, a, a program called Mumble, and what Mumble is, is it's a voice over IP uh, solution, so you have your clients that all connect to it, uh, and then you can talk back and forth, and because, you know, the Oculus and the, um, the Vive, they have, like, headsets built into them, they have microphones built in, uh, it was relatively quick and easy to kind of get it all set up. But uh, it's a third-party app that runs outside of Unity, which means, for us anyway, um, that you can't do positional audio. You can't say, you know, if someone's over there, they sound like they're over there. If someone's over here, they sound like they're over here. Uh, it's all just kind of like a steady 2D stream of, of sound. Um, so we wanted to try and integrate VoIP inside of uh, the framework itself. Uh, dissonance is kind of one of those possible solutions that we were looking at to kind of build that in and make it so that, you know, like I said, when you're over there, you sound like you're over there. Um, so at this point, though, we had maybe like three or four days left. Um, so we were working on some of that stuff, and it just wasn't coming together fast enough. So we decided maybe we would tackle that in version two. Uh, so we went back to Mumble. We went with what we knew. Um, so and then the other thing that we ended up uh, doing in Sprint 3, another big thing, and this actually helped to address the, the idea of, you know, we didn't really have a great way of telling a story. Uh, we came up with the idea at some point of we'll make a host client type. Uh, and what the host is, it's a special player. It functionally, it works the exact same as all the other players, but it does have this panel. Um, up to this point, the game had only progressed as uh, the person at, sitting at the server station basically would just hit keys and that wouldn't load up the next level. But we gave this host client type the power to actually be the one to change the scenes. 
And the way that that would work is that one of the Global Core uh, staff members would actually be inside of the experience with them. They would be the ones to tell the story. We didn't have enough time to like weave something together and script something. Um, so we were the ones to do it, and we would do it uh, inside the space along with them and tell the story that way, and then just naturally as you know, the scenes progressed, we would uh, just uh, move on to the next thing. The last thing we did uh, in Sprint 3 is a whole lot of polish, uh, with the time that we had left anyway. Um, we were pretty happy with the whole thing uh, overall, but we just wanted to make sure that we got it to be as tight as is humanly possible with the time we had left. So that brings us to showtime. Um, whoops, we got to, there we go. Uh, got to Santa Clara, started setting up. You can see kind of our, you know, hack solutions over there with the cables and stuff like that, uh, giant mess. Uh, that was the space we had to work in on the top left. Uh, in the middle, you can kind of see, this is our bit of our command station here. We had, um, uh, that's, I believe, the server. And we were also just remoting in and kind of observing all the players as they were playing. Um, the server we set up as another VoIP client, so uh, you know there was the host player that was inside the space. You can see uh, Ben up in the corner there on the far right. He was our host inside of the game, um, but we also had the server player, and that you know was basically running like the command center. Basically, if anything went wrong, uh, then they would be the ones to fix it, and they could also talk back and forth with everyone inside of the space. So, on to another video. So this is Free Roam VR kind of in action. Okay. Here we go. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. So one of the kind of funny uh, takeaways from this whole thing was actually that you can totally just trick people into doing the thriller dance, and it's like not even hard. <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, one of our, um, one of the people on site with us actually just kept telling everyone that that was part of, there was, there was a dance puzzle that they had to solve in order to complete the level, which like that wasn't even a thing, it didn't even make any sense. But we just kept telling them that, and they're kind of like, okay, yeah, cool, let's do it. Um, which was like hilarious. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so how did we do? So it turns out there was actually um, uh, awards that were being given out, uh, Best in Show, there was all kinds of awards that were being given out for you know, AR, VR, uh, all kinds of th stuff at the show. Um, so how did we do? Well, actually, we... <laughs> oh, the sound didn't play. Um, we won Best in Show for virtual reality, actually. Um, which was an honor. It was amazing that we managed to go from, like I said, kind of nothing uh, to in the span of about three weeks having something that was award-winning. Uh, it was kind of amazing. 
Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of us up on stage with our award being kind of just generally shocked that that just happened. Um, so next steps. Uh, so, you know, for the free roam framework, we're not quite done it yet. There's other stuff that we want to do. We kind of keep learning. We kind of keep doing extra stuff. And we want to roll it back into the, the framework to make it, you know, even more flexible and powerful as we go. Uh, so one of those things is 3D scan player avatars. We actually have a scan station at our office by a company called It's Me. Um, it's a giant booth that you stand in, and it takes pictures at you from all sides, and it will actually just turn you into an avatar. And the whole process takes, uh, I think, about five minutes or so. Um, but we're actually working with them. They're going to give us uh, an API. Um, so that we have the ability to kind of take their scans, uh, bring them inside of the game, and then they'll be rigged and ready to go so you can actually play as you, basically, inside of a game. Um, so that's planned. Uh, another one, which I have a video for, uh, is non-Euclidean geometry. So I was talking about some of this stuff earlier. Of course, now video sound plays. Uh, so that impossible geometry that I was talking about earlier, um, it ended up being super pow powerful for us at uh, Samsung, you know, in a 10-foot by 20-foot space. Uh, but just imagine if you had, you know, a 60 foot by a 30 foot space, the kind of the stuff that you could do with that. Um, so that is another thing that we're planning on kind of adding into the framework. Uh, and positional player audio, like I was mentioning before. Uh, we want to get there. We want to make sure that we kind of add that stuff in and make it so that, you know, everyone sounds like where they're supposed to sound. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the plans going forward. And uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>